Krishna Kshetra Swami, a very warm welcome yes. to you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, just by means of introduction, I'm by no means qualified to do this. Uh, don't feel qualified, but here it is. Krishna Kshetra Swami, also known as Dr. Kenneth Valpe, is a research fellow of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies and of the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics. He is also the co-director of the Bhagavad Purana Research Project. Very fortunate uh, for us to have you, Krishna Shetra Swami, today. We aren't able to see your video, so whenever you're ready, please uh, switch on your camera. And the topic for today that uh, Krishna Shetra mm. Swami will be presenting is the map is not the territory. Mapping hermeneutic approaches to the Bhagavatam's cosmologies. So please go for it. The stage is all yours. Thank you, Kunal. And... My thanks to all of you who have been organizing this course. I think it's a, a wonderful initiative of the Bhaktivedanta Institute for Higher Studies. Let's see if I can share my screen. I think so. Let's see. Sharing screen, share. How is that? Okay. And we'll do full screen. There we go. Okay, uh, this is going to be basically what I uh, spoke at a conference at Bhaktivedanta Institute for Higher Studies uh, some months ago. But this is for those of you who were not, uh, not present for that. So indeed, the map is not the territory, is my topic and mapping hermeneutic approaches to the Bhagavatam's cosmology uh, is the more specific uh, intention. So I start with a quote from the Bhagavatam, uh, the fifth canto. This is from chapter 16, uh, verse 21. The mud on both banks of the river Jambu Nadi being moistened by the flowing juice and then dried by the air and the sunshine, produces huge quantities of gold called Jambu Nada. The denizens of heaven use this gold for various kinds of ornaments. Therefore, all the inhabitants of the heavenly planets and their youthful wives are fully decorated with golden helmets, bangles, and, and belts, and thus, they enjoy life. Um, well, that's very nice. Uh, we hear this description, but what do we understand from it? And so I want to bring in uh, this rather famous phrase from um, American, uh, Polish-American philosopher of the 20th century, Alfred Kozybski. Uh, and I think this um, little diagram gives the basic idea of what he's saying. Uh, we start perhaps on the left with reality as such. Uh, we perceive it with our senses, um, which are, have constraints, and we understand are imperfect. From that, we get some understanding, and from that, uh, there are filters, and then all of this might be articulated in some, um, some form or another, and we can call it a graph, uh, sorry, a map, um, broadly speaking. <clears throat> so two questions I'm wanting to address. What is the relation between the Bhagavata's descriptions um, in written form, that is, li linguistic representations, and the actualities out there that the text describes. It tells us that these are actualities somewhere in the universe. But another question is, what is the relation of attempts at mapping hermeneutical, that is interpretive approaches to the first question, to any actual interpretive practices or to the conceptualizing of such 
interpretive practices. So this is a kind of second order uh, reflection on what the process of interpretation is all about. Hermeneutics 108, uh, of course, I'm speaking about Western hermeneutics here. And uh, a short definition, uh, hermeneutics is the art of practice of interpretation. Okay. Uh, we have a list here of five prominent um, Western philosophers of hermeneutics. Um, I think all of them are German except one French, Paul Ricoeur. And uh, my interest goes specifically and especially to the work of um, Hans-Georg Gadamer. Um, he creates or he establishes a philosophical framework uh, that recognizes complexity of interpretation uh, and of understanding. And more specifically, He's interested in, uh, in the notion of dialogue, and uh, he wants interpretation to be a reflexive process, which means reflecting on oneself as one is engaged in the process. And he wants to acknowledge uh, the role of our biases and the traditions with which we come to any interpretation especially of a text and usually of a religious text. Uh, and to, he wants to do this while seeking to bridge the gap between, um, well, he calls them horizons, uh, our horizon and the horizon of others. Uh, to explain all of this, he writes uh, extensively. And of course, there's no time here to elaborate. But I want to um, suggest three general categories, uh, which Gadamer talks about, um, three types of hermeneutics. Broadly speaking, there's the hermeneutics of consent. There's the hermeneutics of suspicion and uh, what Gadamer calls integrative, integrative hermeneutics, and I want to unpack these briefly. And we'll start with the, uh, the Bhagavata's hermeneutics of consent. And as an example of this, I'm taking a quote from uh, a very traditional uh, 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 acharya of the Madhva Sampradaya Vijaya Tirtha. So, the words of Vyasa, an ocean of infinite wisdom cannot be doubted. And according to him, quote, details regarding the world, the earth's sheaths, should be taken as per the Bhagavatam. Any other text in case of contradiction should be reconciled as required. So that's, you can say, consenting to the statements of Shastra. Uh, he goes on to say, and this is in response to uh, a verse which comes one or two verses earlier uh, in the passage that I, I was reading, where it says that uh, these jambu fruits are the size of elephants. So now he wants to explain, the size of an elephant is meant to perceive the fullness and not actual dimension. So we may breathe easily. We may think, oh, okay, so it's figurative. But then he goes on to say, the actual size is mentioned in the Vayu Purana as, quote, sages who directly and truly perceive entities, that is, Rishibi Tattva Darshibi, have told the fruit to be 861 Aratnis. What's an aratni? It's the distance from the elbow uh, to the fingertip in size. Multiplied by 861, and you have something like four football field lengths. Okay, elephants that size. 
That's what the Acharyas say. That's what the Vayu Purana says. Right. Well, <laughs> uh, this sounds like a kind of literalism in the Bhagavatam. And one might be concerned that this is what's called in philosophy naive realism. Well, but you can say, anyway, it's poetry. Uh, it, it's, it's all written in poetic language. Uh, but uh, the, the claim could be made from a consent, hermeneutics of consent position, that, well, what we're saying here is that the map is the territory. <clears throat> well, there are examples of multiple interpretations in the Bhagavatam. I would point out Sanatan Goswami's Brihad Vaishnav Toshini commentary on the 10th canto, I would also point out uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's allegorical interpretations of Krishna's childhood demon-killing leelas, but he does not deny their literal meaning. He adds the allegorical meaning. Okay, then we can look at uh, Richard Thompson's acknowledgement in his book, The Mysteries of the Sacred Universe. There are multiple versions and variations of cosmology and cosmography in the various Puranas, in the Mahabharata, uh, and in Jain and Buddhist texts. He acknowledges this. So we may say, okay, traditional Shastric hermeneutics to the rescue uh, in the um, uh, Vedanta Sutra, the Brahma Sutra, Tattu Samanvayat, Lord Krishna is the conclusion because of the totality of all scriptural statements. And so we might go back to Gadamer uh, in his process of interpretation and see how we're reading, interpreting, reading further, interpreting, continuing this process uh, of part and whole analysis, this may bring us uh, to some understanding. And if we take it that, yes, we're putting Krishna in the center of the circle of hermeneutic interpretation, uh, or we're put, putting him across the horizon, and thus we come to a proper understanding, possibly. Well, let's move on now to um, <laughs> the hermeneutics of suspicion. Um, this was coined by Paul Ricoeur. Um, the famous three masters of suspicion, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, are well-known figures. And um, the basic idea of uh, hermeneutics of suspicion is that the straightforward meanings of texts is regarded as deceptive or self-deceptive. Explicit texts hide deeper meanings and implications, um, and this especially is understood to boil down to establishing and maintaining power over and oppression of others. Um, well, how this might be applied, the hermeneutics of suspicion, I take uh, an excerpt from Patanjali Yoga Sutras, um, where is described in the third pada the process of samyama and the results. So, for example, uh, we have these uh, three statements, bhūmana jñānam surye samyamat, by performing samyama on the sun, arises knowledge of the different realms in the universe. And similarly, samyama on the moon, knowledge of the solar systems. Samyama on the pole star, knowledge of movement of stars. Okay, here comes the suspicions. Well, yogic powers may be a hook to entice inherent uh, adherents uh, part of a cynical marketing scheme for yoga. Yoga offers the promise of power to the powerless. Or 
There may be a psychological explanation. Yoga powers are an expression of infantile powerlessness, overcoming repressed childhood experiences of powerlessness. Uh, and so many more explanations could be uh, suggested. Moving quickly on, we go up to integrative uh, hermeneutics. And here we can consider some of the ideas of Richard Thompson, again, in his book, Mysteries of the Sacred Universe. Um, his efforts at mapping the Bhagavatam's fifth canto onto contemporary geographic and cosmographic accounts. And in particular, his notion of the context-sensitive models. He says, in the Bhagavatam, the context-sensitive approach was rendered particularly appropriate by the conviction uh, <clears throat> that reality and the ultimate issue is avak manasam, or beyond the reach of the mundane mind or words. This implies that a literal one-to-one -one model of reality is unattainable. And so one may as well pack as much meaning as possible into a necessarily incomplete description of the universe. And so in this way, um, I would say Richard Thompson's affirming this notion that the map is not the territory applies to the Bhagavatam. Uh, it is necessarily incomplete, he says. <clears throat> um, okay. So he acknowledges figurative language. Uh, he uses quotation marks. Uh, around these two terms, islands and oceans, in referring to the rings of Bhumandala. Um, and so he, he says the geography of Bhumandala encodes a combination of astronomical and geographical um, maps, which is both rational and scientific. Um, and he says it appears... <clears throat> that this geography uh, is introduced or adapted to convey a number of meaningful messages, some of which may still remain obscure. Uh, and this process, process may be linked to, uh, says Richard Thompson, the historical development of Purana cosmology. Again, we have three hermeneutics uh, styles hermeneutics of consent, of suspicion, and integrative hermeneutics. There's a fourth option uh, which I want to share, I want to suggest extending integrative hermeneutics. And this is the thinking of Dr. Jessica Frazier, who is a, uh, a lecturer in theology and religion at Trinity College, Oxford. And she suggests, and it's interesting, by the way, she wrote her doctoral dissertation on Gadamer and Rupa Goswami. She got them speaking to each other, so to say. She suggests, rather than dialogue, which was Gadamer's idea, between two supposedly disparate worldviews, what may be called for is what she calls triangulation of multiple voices, what she calls choral hermeneutics. Now, we want to apply this, I want to suggest, to interpreting the Bhagavatam. And I've uh, suggested here with this uh, simple diagram that we we may have four sorts of orientations that we need to take into account in interpreting the Bhagavatam, including interpreting about jambu fruits falling and becoming gold mixed with water of uh, juice and mud and so on. And it gets more complicated <laughs> when we uh, add 
the particulars, the specifics of non-Indic traditions, of uh, our current readers, and of course, our um, Vedic corpus and the commentarial tradition, or one should perhaps say commentarial traditions. Um, so just to kind of bring this together briefly, I'm suggesting that at least using Western thought about uh, hermeneutics, we consider this idea that the map is not the territory. There is the hermeneutics of consent, uh, but what did this hermeneutics of consent lead us to? To uh, picture uh, jambu fruits, which are the size of uh, four football fields. The hermeneutics of suspicion is there, and I want to point out the Bhagavatam also uses the hermeneutics of suspicion, applying it to uh, materialistic worldviews. And then we have integrative hermeneutics of Richard Thompson's analysis in the mis uh, Mysteries of the Sacred Universe. Uh, what um, Jessica Fraser calls choral hermeneutics may also be something we need to consider as an option if we're going to do comprehensive hermeneutics of uh, the Bhagavatam. Um, Srila Prabhupada said in his commentary to the verse which I quoted, it is understood that in a higher planetary system in this material world, the mud on the banks of the Jambu Nadi mixes with Jambu juice, reacts with the sunshine in the air, and automatically produces huge quantities of gold. To me, that leaves many questions un unanswered. It is understood by whom and how. Uh, so this leaves us leaves me with questions, and uh, I hope it leaves you with some thoughts on the subject of hermeneutics of the Bhagavatam. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much, Krishna Kshetra Swami, for that fantastic talk. Um, unfortunately, we don't have uh, enough time to take questions, but there may be some in the Q&A box which you may be able to address by hand there. Okay, so... Uh, Maybe while we are switching to the next speaker, I just ask you maybe in one sentence, if you were to summarize, what is really the solution here? How do we understand the Bhagavatam's cosmology? Do we need to take up the yogic uh, powers in order to understand it thoroughly? Or do you think there are other means? And in the meantime, I will request Leela to please, uh, or Arya, who is working behind the scenes here, to um, start showing a video of Akhandi Das. But yes, please, Krishna Kshetra Maharaj, if you have any uh, final, like one sentence summary of uh, resolving the issue with Bhagavatam's cosmology. You want me to respond? <laughs> If there is a one sentence description, yeah. Um, my one sentence is simply, I think we need to recognize that there's a, um, a range of ways to approach the issue. Um, and we should be careful not to um, un, uh, uh, artificially limit our ways of approaching the issue. That's my one sentence reply. Okay, fantastic.